Facilitation and Reviewing and Outdoor Education. In this video, I'll be discussing my philosophy of facilitation and reviewing, what the advantages and disadvantages are to each idea and techniques, and how they can be used through activities and structures. This will be achieved through the use of personal experience and supported by academic writings. Before I can describe what facilitation and reviewing is and how it is used, first I must ask myself what is outdoor education and why do I facilitate? Each facilitation technique is different, with everyone having a slightly different outcome depending on what it is I'm trying to be achieved. Facilitation and reviewing according to the Oxford Dictionary 2019 is simply a person or a thing that makes a progress easier and states that reviewing uh, states reviewing as a formal assessment of something with the intention of instituting change if necessary. Within my philosophy, I simply regard it as some, someone who provides, uh, who guides the experience with the reviewing at the end as a technique to reflect back on that activity. I've always had a fond interest in the outdoors in sharing my knowledge with others by facilitating an experience that will highlight the importance of the outdoors on our development. I work at an outdoor centre as well as studying outdoor education and learning at university, giving me some knowledge and the experience to better my facilitation and reviewing approaches. There are many different approaches to facilitation and reviewing and whether it is even necessary in the first place. Again, this comes down to what we are doing it for and what we as a facilitator are there to do. My philosophy as a facilitator can be expressed through Greenaway 2004 Facilitation and Reviewing in the Outdoor Education, when he talks about how facilitation should be a focus on the learner's needs, not the learner's focusing on the teacher's wants. One facilitation technique I use is front-loading. This is where I do the initial briefing to the group, a start to finish run through of the activities, giving key points in advance of the experience. I usually use this as a collecting point to get everyone together on the same mind frame in order to be focused on the activity ahead. This is a strong technique as it can be backed up by Priest and Gas 2005, Chapter 15, Basic Facilitation Techniques when it talks about how often by briefing participants like this, they, are, they become excited for the activity and it distracts them from why they are doing it. This allows for the learning experience to become very easy. My philosophy in front-loading, however, whilst it is an effective facilitation technique, it does remove the element of surprise if there is too much front-loading. As backed up by Greenaway 2004 Facilitation and Reviewing in Outdoor Education, it can even come across as spoon feeding if done in the wrong way. This is due to the amount of front loading making the experience too easy. My way to minimise this happening is only brief what needs to be in order to make them excited and comfortable, but also allow for elements of surprise and challenge through the activity, giving an overall better and more effective experience. Another facilitation technique that I use is the use of isomorphic metaphors. This is where essentially I will facilitate an activity that symbolises that of a real life lesson or progress. A prime example of a session I run is a blindfolded spider web activity. This is where a length of rope is attached from tree to tree and the rope is overcrossing and perhaps tangled a bit like a spider's web and the blindfolded participant must find the exit. This is often used as it's easy and appealing to facilitators to symbolise the struggles of finding your way out of large issues such as addiction. This is a really simple yet powerful sensory and translating way for the participants to see a correlation between overcoming an activity and overcoming a real life situation. I feel how this activity, if involving metaphors of serious real life problems, can be very risky. The reason being, if participants are unable to find the end of the hand line, then they may translate this into not finding a way to escape their problems such as addiction. When reading McDonald's 2000 Issues in Progress, I came to find a solution to run this effective facilitation activity and still maintain its easy to grasp and translatable impact. I simply use metaphors that are less personal and have, as a result, less consequence if the participant is unsuccessful. Through these simple, thought-provoking metaphors, it allows the participant to engage with their surroundings and therefore translate progress and development within their activity into real life. Often when running an activity, I use the sense of place as a facilitation technique. I began to use this technique after reading Harrison's 2010, Why Are We Here? 
taking place into account in UK outdoor environmental education. This is almost a combination between a very priest and gassing facilitation and also allowing for the experience to speak for itself. It uses a sense of place to facilitate the experience. In personal experience, I have always found the place in which the activity is run can have a massive impact on the engagement as expressed through Harrison's 2010 writing. This is because the focus on place allows for participants to ask questions that they wouldn't in a more static environment. Within Harrison's paper, he discusses this shift from an egocentric, human-centred approach of learning. I try to implement the same approach within my practice as I fully believe in the sense of place being able to facilitate in a way I simply could not. This three-dimensional environmental picture paints a thousand words, or should I say a thousand questions waiting to be asked. Again expressed through Harrison's paper, by using the sense of place, it not only allows for engagement on surroundings, but also its community and deeper understanding to what is relevant. Connecting yourself to culture is a massive factor in finding who you are and how we develop. Lastly, the paper goes on to talk about how a deeper engagement and understanding comes from a role of giving back to the community and the environment. This is important as it allows for the participant when on the activity to go through the full cycle of place, being a tool for facilitation. Place stimulates engagement and connections to learning when in the environment. It goes on to give a deeper understanding into the connection with the community and what's relevant to that specific place. It then allows for the participant to give back in some way. I believe, however, that just the same as participants may connect their experiences with place, this also may mean negative experiences may result in no longer enjoying the place or anything similar. This may even dissuade them from going to the outdoors totally. A further criticism is that participants may cause more harm than helpfulness. Uh, what we may give back to place may not be what is needed. A further facilitation technique I use is allowing the mountains to speak for themselves. This is a term used by Thomas James 1980 in his writing Can the Mountains Speak for Themselves? Meaning, the outdoors can it be taken at face value by simply, simply as a good day out with no other factors required for learning or progress to occur. I use this method often as I believe that the sheer impact of the outdoors alone can be enough to stimulate the outcome desired. This can be backed up by Pete McDonald 2000 Issues in Progress where he talks about taking kids outdoors in the rain however through the experience of an off routine day outside alone was enough to facilitate a good day out. I believe a further reason is that it can come across very egotistical and human centred to simply use the mountains as a tool to perform other facilitative activities on rather than acknowledge them for what they are. I believe through this attitude it reflects that we as humans are in control of this environment and that we can use it how we want, however the truth is the opposite. A further advantage is that allowing the mountains to speak for themselves is interpersonal and therefore each person can take away something from a simple day. This is expressed nicely when Priest and Gas 2004 chapter 14 states, these experiences seem to be more unpredictable and unique. Due to this uncertainty, client learning is generally varied and personal. When allowing for the mountains to speak for themselves, I often use this along with another facilitation technique as sometimes the mountains don't communicate their impact to the participants. In Thomas James, 1980, Can the Mountains Speak for Themselves? He discusses a negative side that I agree with, that by simply allowing the mountains to speak for themselves, staff may be transmitting very little culture and few values. Meaning, without this additional bit of facilitation, maybe the learner takes very little or nothing from the mountains speaking for themselves. I agree with the point that is raised within James 1980, where it discusses by allowing the mountains to speak for themselves, there is very little structure and therefore can open to exposure, making it unsafe due to the unpredictable environment. My way of minimising this risk can be expressed through James 1980, where it says you have to do a lot of teaching for the mountains before you have a safe and adventurous context to teach through. Basically meaning you need to prepare for the dangers of the mountains before you can use them to teach. The importance of review. I feel that the debrief or the reviewing section is one of the most important parts of the facilitation process as it's what brings everything together and personally see a much longer lasting effect by doing so. 
This can be backed up in, in Greenaway's 2004 Facilitation and Reviewing and Outdoor Education, when it states, Without the sense of action to the debrief, it is often a lifeless, futile exercise. The experience can come alive in the debrief. The experience can be relived. The discussion is not a static, safe, merely cognitive exercise. It has feeling, anger, frustration, accomplishment and fun. School, Poetry and Radcliffe, 1988-166. When reviewing an activity, I usually structure this as a way of gathering everyone at the end of the session and go over the key outcomes that were achieved in the activities. But my approach is backed up by Priest and Gas 2005, Chapter 15, where it talks about my role is, allowed, is to allow discovery in their own learning without adding my own judgment to what a learning occurred. I remain simply as a guide. I simply get. I remain simply guiding the reviewing by asking questions, encouraging clients to share their experiences and personal observations. After reading Priest and Gas 2005, Chapter 14, it highlighted how important it was for myself to avoid speaking on behalf of the experience. I never tell individuals what they got out of an experience as they may not have actually experienced this. Therefore, you risk alienating and disconnecting the individual from future learning experiences. Often when doing the reviewing session, I try to facilitate a group discussion. This is because I believe that by being in a group, we can pick up possible missed outcomes that someone else may not have thought about, but also have a chance to support or challenge the point. If the participant if the participants are reluctant to vocally speak in front of the group or get involved in the discussion, I use more creative mediums such as role play, speech, woodland art, or acting. This approach is backed up by Precinct Gas 2005, Chapter 15, Basic Facilitation Techniques, where it talks about the use of non verbal methods that will help include reluctant participants and allow for the reviewing process to occur. It discusses the use of closed questions as a bridge to opening up onto more descriptive responses. Sometimes I facilitate alternative methods of reviewing, allowing for a more inclusive experience that stimulates the responses needed. One method is by using place as a way to provide more productive experiences when reviewing the session. This can be expressed through Harrison's 2010 Why Are We Here? taking place into account in the UK outdoor environmental education. This is where it talks about the significance that place has on being able to stimulate thought and analysis on the environment around us and therefore it could be transformed over to the reviewing of the experience. When reviewing, I often go long walks or sit in the woods as the connections to place allow for stimulation of the mind and the thought process to occur. In conclusion, we can therefore say there are many important uses of facilitation and reviewing. Facilitation and reviewing can come in different forms, with each one again being significantly more important depending on the outcome required. Each approach should be evaluated on the basis of what it is we are trying to facilitate, and whether it's even correct to do so in the first place. Through the, through the use of academic writings and personal experience, I have been able to develop what I think are some of the best approaches to facilitation and reviewing. This in turn has allowed the learning experience for the participants and myself to become more valuable.